My name is Bethika Thompson. I'm an endocrinologist at Mayo Clinic in Arizona. Uh, I gave a talk today on use of diabetes medications in type 2 diabetes, uh, specifically regarding how the drugs work and when to use them and how to add them on uh, when uh, adjusting drug therapy in diabetics. In addition, I talked about diabetes technology, including insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitors, and gave some general information about those for the primary care physician. You know, for the top three takeaways uh, for my talk, the first thing is that I want people to understand how the diabetes drugs work. The second thing is I want people to understand uh, when you should choose one drug over another, um, and how to think about these drugs when you're adjusting therapy, when to add them, when to remove them, and so forth. And the third thing is just to get a general understanding um, about diabetes technology um, in the diabetic patients, so when you come across these patients in clinic, you understand a little bit more about what they're using. Thank you very much. Uh, I was something I had thought of, but hadn't heard as, as well articulated. You talked about the idea that progression is not failure. And I think that's so valuable for our patients. Can you elaborate on that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think that's probably one of the most important things um, when, when seeing uh, this patient population. And I try to, you know, emphasize it every single time um, that uh, diabetes is a progressive disease. I think it's very important to set expectations uh, for patients so that they're not discouraged. Um, they don't come in thinking that a drug isn't working for them anymore um, or that they think that it's lost its effectiveness. I try to tell them that everything that they do, you know, including you know, all the lifestyle stuff they can do, so their exercise and their diet and watching their weight and all that, it makes a huge, huge difference, but it may not mean that they don't ever have to add a drug again. And it doesn't mean that the diabetes isn't gonna get worse or that the diabetes we see 10 years from now isn't gonna be different than what we're dealing with now. It does make a difference, but the actuality of it is is that diabetes is very much a genetic disease and it's a progressive disease. And so all of those things count, but we have to be willing to constantly adjust our therapy and constantly reassess it. And I think setting those expectations early for patients, there's, there's nothing more important than that because then Every time they see you, they're more willing to, to adjust it and they're more willing to, to think about things. They're not so um, you know, set on, on things not working for them anymore. And I think that's very important. As we're talking about the way early, talk about the, the concept of pre-diabetes. Sure. I've, I've gone back and forth as to whether or not that term, that label is helpful or harmful. Well, I think it's helpful. You know, I mentioned that um, the majority of people with prediabetes in this country actually do not know they're prediabetic. Now, that is a big problem um, because the insulin failure, the beta cell failure um, that, that happens, it happens in the prediabetic period. So by the time we see these diabetic patients, we are often very far behind. Identifying them early um, can be helpful in a motivated patient. You know, I think your job as a physician, I mean, obviously we cannot go home with our patients and make them exercise and eat right. But your job as a physician, you know, I always tell patients that that is the time when they have the biggest ability to improve upon the progression to diabetes. So, so I try to stress to them that this time is, is a really important time for you. It's an exciting time. You can make these changes and you may be able to prevent progression from happening, you know, five years from now, maybe to 10 years from now, you know, to diabetes with all the stuff that you do. We have good trials. We've done all kinds of diabetes prevention trials where we have shown that nothing is better than lifestyle um, in terms of, of preventing this progression. You know, we have some data for metformin, but it is not as good as lifestyle. So stressing to these patients that they are in a very vulnerable period where what they do counts, I think gives them some empowerment, you know, so I try to empower them that way. At what point, is there a particular blood sugar level or is there an A1C level or is it uh, tempered by other risk factors where you say, you know, it's unfortunately it's time to start something? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, you know, it depends on the individual patient um, and particularly the motivation of that patient. So if you have a patient who you know, is, is still in a technically well-controlled diabetic um, range, but is really, really motivated and really, really wants to try to improve upon their lifestyle and they're actually doing that, then I think that's fine, you know, to kind of watch them. But I like to ask people, tell me the truth, you know, I, I know that you want to do these things, but, but are you going to do them? You know, are you going to go home and actually do these things consistently? And if you ask them that, 
most people will say, you know, Doc, I, I want to, but no. I mean, I know that two weeks from now, I probably won't be going to the gym every day, and I probably won't be. So in those patients, then I say, well, I'd rather we do something about it than put you at risk for increased cardiovascular disease just because you don't want to take a medicine. You know, that, that's not in your benefit. So, um, so then they're usually pretty, you know, reasonable, and, and you can start something, you know, like metformin or something like that. I think all of us uh, in primary care are comfortable with metformin, mm -hmm. sulfonylureas, perhaps citagliptin. Yeah. But uh, beyond that, how can we do better and better utilize uh, your expertise? Yeah. No, I, I think that, um, that that is, you know, that, that's true. You know, those drugs um, are the most commonly ones used. And then when it gets down to, you know, using the GLP-1 agonists like Victoza um, or Bayata or um, the SGLT-2 inhibitors um, like Jardians and Invokana, we see a lot less use. And it's too bad because those are the drugs that really have some great outcome data um, associated with them. And so it would be nice to see more use of those. Honestly, I think that you got to just start using them. You know, I, I hate to say that, but I mean, we have all of these guidelines out there. Um, I really strongly urge everyone to, to look at the American Diabetes Association guidelines. There is an abridged um, edition for the primary care doctor. Look at that. Um, look at the slide deck. It's like 10 slides for um, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology and their tables. It tells you what to do. Um, you know, it, it, if you haven't done it before, it might make you nervous. But um, once you do it and you see good results, it, it will become second nature. Um, I can say that these drugs, they're not new anymore. They've been around for a long time. Um, and we should be using them. And, and they probably are underutilized. What sorts of questions or referrals would be most appropriate from me to you? Yeah. Well, I think as an endocrinologist, you know, almost, you know, all type 1 diabetics should be seen an endocrinologist. Um, type 2 diabetics that are particularly complicated um, or starting on insulin or on insulin, that can be a big jump. And so that would be an appropriate referral, you know, for an endocrinologist. Type 2 diabetics that are on multiple drugs but well controlled, probably I don't need to see, you know. Um, it's always reasonable, you know, if you have any kind of questions about starting a new drug, you could always have someone, you know, come and see an endocrinologist and we could get them started on a drug, but then usually they can go back and follow with their primary care doctor. Before we start insulin, oftentimes we have type 2 diabetics uh, testing their blood sugar and there's yeah. uh, mixed uh, advice on that and how effective that sure. is. Uh, what, what are your thoughts? You know, testing the blood sugar is particularly important, you know, as you mentioned, for when you're on insulin, you know, and in, and it's important in that case because it is giving us information uh, how to make adjustments in medical therapy. Um, but, you know, testing your sugars um, before you start on insulin is also very important. And it's very important for me as the doctor um, because it gives me important information when I'm trying to choose what I want to put you on um, to get you to goal, you know? So for example, you know, I like when patients come in to see me in clinic and their sugars are, are too high. I know that, you know, based on their A1C. But if, if I have a patient who comes in and says, you know, my morning numbers are 200s, you know, and their A1C is nine, well, that tells me, you know, their morning numbers are too high. Maybe I can get this down with just a background insulin. You know, I know they're waking up too high, so instead of making a guess as to what I could do next, it gives me information, you know? So I like that, you know, because then I can say, let's put you on Lantus or let's put you on something, let's get those morning numbers down. Um, and we may find that's all they need, you know, to get them to goal. Um, and so it gives us a way to choose our therapy wisely. Um, and that's really the emphasis of my talk is that the more you know about these drugs and how they work, the better you are going to be at picking the right drug for the patient to fix the problem that they have. Um, and that's very important because it's a very different situation than a patient who has great morning numbers, but their A1C is nine, okay? Because then putting them on a background insulin is probably not going to get me much bang for my buck. I need to pick a medicine that's really going to hit those daytime numbers hard. Uh, because that's where they're high. And that medicine might... Could be a multiple things. It could be a daytime insulin. Um, it uh, could be you know, adding metformin in someone who hasn't done it, a GLP-1 agonist, an SGLT-2 inhibitor, a lot of different things, a sulfonylurea with meals, um, a lot of different options based on, on their risk and, and where you want their A1C to go. So it sounds like I should get more comfortable doing it and I should en enlist your expertise to give advice and kind of give me some guidance to, to get started. 
I think that's very reasonable. Yeah, yeah. I think that um, getting started um, with drugs you're not familiar with is, um, you know, is very helpful. But then ultimately, um, yeah, when, once patients are well controlled, they usually do, you know, do pretty well for a while. But it is important to tell them that this may change. And, and then we just reassess it. You know, we find something else that we may have to add. Moving on to the technology, I see a lot of patients where I think that they might benefit from a more effective glucose monitoring, more effective insulin administration, and, and they often are resistant to taking that step as well. Uh, any thoughts, things I uh, might say or do to yeah. help no, facilitate that? Sure. No, I think that, um, you know, oftentimes patients are resistant to trying these things. Um, the one thing I tell people is that this is not a permanent thing, you know, so, so try it. You know, you might like seeing all your numbers. You know, you may not know how nice it is to see all your numbers. And then the minute you do, you're not going to want to live without that, you know. So, so I always tell people, just try it, you know. And I'll tell you, the majority of the people who try it, they end up loving it. Um, and every once in a while, someone doesn't like it and it's not a big deal because they take it off, you know. So it's not, not a big deal. Um, the only thing that you can gain from it is potential improvement in your glycemic control um, and better knowledge from which to make decisions. Um, I try to tell people every time I see them, especially patients on insulin, um, that you are making a lot of blind decisions if you do not have this, this information in front of you. You know, So people don't really like the idea when, when it's posed that way of, of thinking, I'm making a lot of blind decisions. You know what I mean? No one really likes thinking they're making decisions without... Um, you know, any kind of data. Once they have it, most people really, really like like using it, you know. And I, I tell people, too, that it's not something, you know, for instance, like a continuous glucose monitor that's on your phone. Um, if you don't want to look at it, don't look at your phone. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not a big deal. You know, if you want to turn it off overnight because you don't want it on, turn it off, you know. And then when you want it, you turn it back on, you know. So um, I always try to stress to people, you can use it all or none. You know, I mean, it's not a, um, there's a lot of in-between area and you got to find what works for you. The, the biggest thing I'll say for type 1 diabetics and technology is that there are a lot of good ways to control type 1 diabetes. And not everyone needs an insulin pump and not everyone needs a sensor and no one has to do it the same exact way. You know, we have a lot of tools now um, to control diabetes. And so... A doctor's job, I think, is to work with the patient to find what they want to use, what they feel comfortable with, um, and what best fits their lifestyle. Because everyone has a different lifestyle, and so we have to find something that works for them. Um, but usually, people are, are going to really like one piece of technology. Um, and if we work at it, we can usually find something for them. Could you quickly talk about the expectations that are the unrealistic expectations that some patients might yeah. have going into the technology? Sure, sure. Yeah, I think that the biggest unrealistic expectation is that they think that it's going to keep their sugars perfect. Um, they think that they're going to be perfectly even and that their control is going to just be excellent. Um, and that's not true. You know, if anything, when you first start technology, what you notice is how erratic and variable your numbers are because you're seeing so many more for the first time, you know? So it's not an uncommon situation that I start someone on a monitor and they come back and they say, ever since I started this, my numbers are all over the place. You know, I always tell them your numbers are not all over the place. They're probably better, but you're just seeing them now for the first time. And so they look all over the place, you know? Um, so I just tell people that, you know, we, we put you on this so we can see your numbers. Um, we have to have realistic expectations. You know, your numbers are going to go up and down, um, but the purpose of knowing where they are is so that we can make better decisions to try to even that out. Um, keeping them in a straight line is not a realistic expectation. So once people become, um, you know, okay with that, then they're much happier, you know, with, with their result. And, and so I like to bring them in and download their numbers and I show them. And their numbers are a little up and down. And I say, this looks perfect, you know, because we don't expect them to be straight. But what I don't want them to do is to be going like this all day long. You know, I want them to be a little more even. Um, and, and that is a realistic expectation. I occasionally have patients who are on a pump or on a continuous monitor or both. And they say, you know, it's just too difficult or too expensive or too something to continue with the endocrinologist. Can you manage it, doc? Mm -hmm. And I think the answer is, you know, my New Year's resolution is to become more comfortable with those type 2 medications. Yeah. But I think that's still something for the, I think, the yeah. specialist. I would say that type 1 diabetes remains an endocrinologist disease. Yeah, I mean, there's just too many specific things um, that, that go along with it. And 
Um, I, I just don't think that a primary doctor can be expected to download this technology and do all these things that an endocrinologist can do with the capabilities in our office. So I, I, I would highly recommend still that type 1 diabetics see an endocrinologist. And you could make life a whole lot better for a lot of primary care doctors. Any hints about reordering insulins and diabetic supplies and durable medical equipment? I know. No, I don't have any agree. That, that's always been the pain. Yeah. Yeah, it all comes down to that, you know, and that's it's a limiting thing, you know, obviously is reordering these things and then just the cost of the medicines. That's something that's really not gotten a whole lot better in our field, unfortunately. In fact, maybe getting worse. Maybe getting worse, yeah. But we still have a lot of good medicines that are cheap that we can use, and we still can get people under really good control. Dr. Thompson, thank you yes, for your, your uh, great uh, presentation and uh, great answers to questions. Yeah, excellent, great thank day. you. Yeah.